Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hi, everybody. I'm Jessa, and I'm so happy you're here for this episode of Better Sex. I've dedicated my professional life to helping couples enjoy a fulfilling, intimate life. I believe that sex is important. Our connections to other people matter, and we're not living our life to the fullest if we aren't connecting emotionally and sexually with our partner. That's why I'm here, bringing ideas and information to help you live and love better. What a great topic for today's show. We're going to be talking about orgasm. And I mean, I say this to clients all the time. It's not like orgasm is the goal of sex. It certainly doesn't have to be the end of sex, but it is nice to be able to have one if you want one, right? It doesn't have to be the destination, but it can be a stop at least along the way. And the topic today is really about the orgasm gap, the difference in experience between men and women, between people with penises and people with vulvas. And there are all kinds of reasons why there is a gap in pleasure experience between genders and between body types, uh, historical, cultural, scientific, like misinformation, all kinds of things we're going to talk about. Uh, but it's important to close this gap. And I've actually, in, in talking to my guest today, I've decided to be one of her pleasure crusaders. I, I mean, I suppose I really am already in my work as a sex therapist. This is all things I'm talking to my clients about. But it's just so important to point out the inaccuracies that we see in the media you know, on TVs and movies, as well as pornography, for all of us to be talking about what's accurate, what's true, what is female orgasm about, what does it take to get there, and how do we prioritize that and make space for it in our relationships, right? This is this is important social advocacy in addition to an important component to a life-changing experience for a woman who maybe has not shared orgasm with a partner. It's all rooted in this mis- information, this idea that penetrative sex is as pleasurable for women as it is for men, right? Likely to be orgasmic for men, highly unlikely to be orgasmic for women, especially without, you know, certainly without additional clitoral stimulation. Anyway, we're going to have a whole conversation about the orgasm gap, about her book, Becoming Clitorate, about how to recognize the problems, where they come from, what do we do, how do we talk to our partners about it, and how do we really change our sex life and change the world, you know, through pleasure. It's important. So my guest today is Lori Mintz, uh, Dr. Lori Mintz. She wrote this book, Becoming Clitorate. I think it came out about a year ago. She's an award-winning college professor. She teaches the psychology of human sexuality to hundreds of students a year at the University of Florida. 20 years of experience working with with private clients in a small therapy practice. She's won professional awards. She's a fellow of the American Psychological Association, published over 50 research studies, <laughs> writes a Psychology Today blog. I mean, this woman, she knows what she's talking about. And I'm delighted that she's taken the time to be on the show today to talk about her book and about the orgasm gap. I hope you enjoy it. So, Lori, thank you so much for being with me today. I'm really excited to be here. So I would love to start by hearing about why you wrote Becoming Clitorate. You know, what sort of story of uh, you taking that project on? Well, the story really has to do with my undergrad students at the University of Florida. And I teach psychology of human sexuality at University of Florida to over 150 students a year. And it was really their experiences, their reactions to class material, their successes, their frustrations, their stories that inspired me to write Becoming Clitorate. In a nutshell, through teaching this class, 
I really became aware of the massive orgasm gap that we have between women and men during heterosexual sexual encounters, um, hookup and relationship sex, and the reasons behind those, the orgasm gap, and how much misinformation young people today have about female orgasms. It's like a whole generation of knowledge has been lost to them. Wow. And so as I, yeah, it really feels like that, which I can get into more in a minute if you want. Yeah. But the bottom line is through teaching these students, I realized that, and I called them in a blog that went kind of viral, the most misinformed generation <laughs> ever about wow. sex. That while they have no good sex ed, they also they do have porn at their fingertips. I was going to say that's got to be what's partly what's different in this generation versus previous ones, right? All the misinformation we get from pornography. Exactly. So we don't have good sex ed. So they then they watch porn, and there's nothing wrong with porn. It's entertainment, but it isn't education. And these they don't know that, and so there there's so many young women thinking that something is wrong with them, terribly wrong with them because they're not orgasming during intercourse. And so many young men thinking something's wrong with them because they can't make this happen with their penis. And it's like the the clitoral knowledge has was gone. And as I taught these students, I'd get notes like, wow, thanks to the information in this class, I'm orgasmic. Or thanks to this class, my girlfriends are orgasmic and I wanted to spread the information more broadly. And so that's why I wrote Becoming Clitorate. That's amazing. It sounds to me like you get some pretty uh, personal conversations with these students if you're hearing their stories and, you know, you're getting to this level of explicitness with them. Which is pretty amazing given that there's 150 to 200 students in the class. Yeah. A lot of the students will come talk to me privately or they'll raise their hand. But the other place I get the information, which is really fun, and there's a lot of this information in Becoming Clitorate, is I use these eye clickers. So it's anonymous polling technology. Ah, okay. So I can can ask them a question and get their responses and show them how it compares to the research. Um, So for example, I say, how many of you people with vulvas out there have faked orgasm, lo and behold, 70%, just like it says in the research literature. So I have that data and that data really spurs conversations because people are like, oh my gosh, I'm not alone. Well, and especially when you compare that to, I don't know what the data is, but how many of you uh, male partners think your your partner is having an orgasm in sex, right? (laughs) I mean, I've certainly had clients that say, oh, all my partners have orgasm in sex. It's like, well, the numbers would not back you up on that. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Statistically speaking. (laughs) Right. What are the odds, right? Right. It's like that Harry met Sally, the fake orgasm scene. You know, it starts out with him saying, well, all my partners aren't complaining. They're all having an orgasm. She's like, well, how do you know? I just (laughs) do. No, you don't. (laughs) Exactly. So what are some of the common, you know, what's the misinformation that's out there? What are the most prevalent myths or, or ideas that need to be taken apart? There's so many reasons for the orgasm gap, but in terms of the misinformation that is out there, that really becoming clitorate is this cornerstone of trying to eradicate is the idea that intercourse is the ultimate pleasure for women. It is the way they should orgasm. Mm. And in fact, it is the way they should orgasm and enjoy sex with very little foreplay. You know, if you look Mm. at porn, like there's very little foreplay. He puts his penis in her vagina and she's like, "Ah!" right, right. So to me, that's really the centerpiece. There's so many other layers, but that is the centerpiece of the misinformation that this generation is missing. Wow. Okay. And I I will say, I mean, I have older clients too, who also don't understand the data on this, right? Like it's, it's not only this youngest generation that, that is struggling with this idea. You know, no, absolutely not. That's, I really appreciate. I wrote the book sort of for that generation, but I have had many, many women of older generations saying, wow, this was life altering yeah. as well. Yeah. So what are some of the other reasons uh, for the pleasure gap? 
So some of the other reasons besides the the idea that we should all be orgasming from intercourse are body image issues and cognitive distractions. I mean, the we have these you know, idealized, and it's not just of women, but this is focused on that. You know, there's this idealized image of female bodies. And so, so many women are so self-conscious of their bodies during sex. And as I say in the book, it's impossible to have an orgasm when you're holding your stomach in. Mm. Um, So that's (laughs) one. And I I know I tried for many years. It doesn't work, you know. Um, a lack of, <laughs> exactly. A uh, lack of training in sexual communication. Mm. So, you know, not being able to say, hey, this is what I want. Uh, a um, sort of these media images of women whose role is to uh, please and attract men versus to think about what they want for their own, you know, their own pleasure. It's instead of being all about attracting uh, men, sort of a lack of ability of, of being able to just, you know, say what you want. And then finally, like, and this relates to the other reason, but our, our whole sexual script that we see, not just in porn, but in mainstream movies as well, you know, is like a little bit of foreplay intercourse, you know, simultaneous orgasm, sex yeah. over. Um, and even the words we use, you know, we use the word sex and intercourse synonymously. We call all of women's genitals a vagina, right? Um, gearing the clitoris. So there's so many layers to this r- and reasons why. Yeah. And it's, it does seem tied to gender inequality, right? Like there's yeah. a whole political aspect. I mean, you're sort of alluding to that with the language and everything else, but there's such a political association with this too. Absolutely. And that's why, you know, to be very frank, becoming clitorate is a combination of cultural analysis or feminist analysis and self-help because this is this is really where the personal is very, you know, the political is very personal. Yeah. And it's about bringing gender equality into our most intimate relationships. This is sort of an aside, but when you work with people, well, do you work with clients as well? Yes, I do. Okay. I have okay. a, I teach at the University of Florida and I have a small private practice. Okay. I'm just sort of wondering how frequently people get angry <laughs> when they read this and think they've been, you know, robbed for a while. I mean, you know, when this all comes clear, uh, how many people respond with anger or outrage? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I haven't had outrage to the book in that way, but I have had outrage. I show in my class and I talk about this video in the book as well. I recommend it. There's a video by Betty Dotson of her teaching a woman how to masturbate to orgasm. It's Mm -hmm. called, it's the Carol video. It's Becoming Orgasmic Carol, I think it's called. Okay. And my students react with outrage to that. Like, what? Why didn't anyone ever tell me this? Like, I feel mad. I feel cheated. Hmm. Yeah. You know, so maybe there's people out there reading the book and feeling angry. That's entirely possible. But mostly I hear like, whoa, eye-opening, empowering, like cleared up misinformation. But sure. I mean, if you really think about the whole weight of the culture, every if you start analyzing every word, every image about female orgasm that's in mainstream and porn media, it's enough to make anyone furious because it's just full of misinformation and and then take our sex ed system right, right on top of right. that where <laughs> you <Yeah>. know <laughs> the deck is stacked against us in so many ways, right? And Absolutely. It's been perpetuated for I don't know, millennia? I'm not even sure. I think you have a section in the book about the history of this. I do. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's, you know, it's interesting, like clitoral knowledge has been lost and found, lost and found, lost and found again and again over time. First it's in the textbooks, then it's taken out. I mean, it's just, there's such a history of negating um, the importance of the clitoris. Yeah. And I think it's really time. It's 2018. It's time. It's the year of the clitoris. I mean, I feel angry. You know, it just, it, it, 
and maybe it's just because of my role as a sex therapist and working with people, but it's like, it pisses me off. So, yeah, it does me too. It yeah. does me too. Yes. So I guess bottom line, how, how do we close this orgasm gap? Like what, what are the steps or, or the process or, you know, what do we need to all be thinking about, you know, male and female to address the problem? Yeah. And it's such a deeply ingrained cultural problem. I really think we need a new sexual revolution of pleasure equality. Mm-hmm. The sexual revolution of the 60s made it more acceptable for women to have sex, meaning intercourse outside right. of marriage. But it did nothing to make sure that those relationships were equally pleasurable for women and men. So what do we need to do? Close the orgasm gap. In my dream world, we change our sex education system. It mm. all starts there. Yeah. Where you actually have sex ed, where we talk about consent and communication and we label the clitoris and we talk about pleasure. And I, you know, I don't see that happening yeah. here very soon, sadly. So I think it's more an individual and you know, activism, you know, just talking to people, like having people be given accurate knowledge about female orgasm, being, you know, calling out lies when you see it, you know, yeah. you're watching a movie with a friend and like, oh my gosh, that's fake. You yeah. Know? Yeah. That it's kind like of pl- thing. The pleasure crusaders or something. You know? Oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's what we need. We need yeah. a bunch of pleasure crusaders. <laughs> Absolutely. Jessa here, just taking a quick break. Thanks for listening. Are you interested in being a guest on the show? I'm always looking for people with expertise to share that could enrich other people's sex lives. And I'm also interested in hearing from people who have transformed their own intimate relationship and would want to share their story with my listeners. So if you've got something to contribute to the discussion and want to see about being featured on an upcoming episode, please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com and check out the Be A Guest details. You'll find everything you need there. So I'm, I'm thinking about women who have never had an orgasm. Or I'll hear in my practice, people aren't sure if they've had one. But, you know, what's the advice for women who haven't discovered this for themselves? Like, how, you know, how do you coach them or how should they proceed to find their own pleasure. Yeah. Masturbate, masturbate, masturbate. Um, That is, well, first of all, like, you know, really, really important to do two things. I think three things, three steps. One is, okay, four steps. Um, (laughs) As many as as you need. That's okay. (laughs) So I think the first thing is to, you know, for women to really educate themselves on their own genital anatomy, since no one else has probably done that. Okay. Don't know what you have. It's a little hard to use it. You know, it's like using a tool with your eyes closed. So Mm -hmm. that's a good first step. You know, if my clients take a look, you know, look at their parts. Second step is to learn mindfulness, you know, get your head in the game. Mindfulness is the ability to focus completely and totally on your body sensations, the sensations of the moment. And it doesn't take a lot of like long meditations to do it. You can learn that in your everyday life and then apply it to sex. And then mindful masturbation, really taking the time to touch yourself, you know, and I have a whole bunch of suggestions for that, you know, that range from taking a bubble bath and a glass of wine to relax to just the opposite, going for a run to Mm. get your blood pumping. You know, there's just really taking the time, buying a vibrator, bringing yourself to orgasm. And then the final step is not only communicating what you need to a partner, but feeling empowered. That, that you deserve that pleasure during partnered sex, that it's not all focused on your partner's orgasm. Yeah. Any tips for, I mean, this is another another thing I hear from clients is they, they're maybe orgasmic alone, but have, have never or almost never had an orgasm with a partner. Yes, I hear that a lot too. And that's because when women are alone, 
only, interestingly, Cher Height found this, and in a study a student of mine did, she replicated, it's not published yet, but I can tell you that only about 1.2% of women masturbate exclusively by putting something inside their vagina. Yeah. The vast majority focused on clitoral stimulation. And sometimes paired with penetration, sometimes not. Yet when with partners, especially partners with penises, somehow what we do alone starts, we start to think of it as this separate thing. And, you know, rather than extending that into sex with a partner. And I think the most essential step for a person with a vulva to orgasm with a partner is to get the same type of stimulation as that person gets when they're by themselves. And any that can be done and it means changing our sexual scripts, but you know, any any masturbation style can be transferred to partner sex with some creativity and some willingness to change the sexual script. Yeah. Where, you know, a turn taking one rather than both orgasming at the same time through, through penetration. This, right, through the same yes. activity. Yeah. Yes. But I'm also thinking I've got clients who do well, I mean maybe not fully, but do seem to replicate the same kind of stimulation, but somehow can't release or let go or or I don't know, take up the space maybe. So, you know, something yeah. prevents them from having that experience you know, with a partner slash witness, I think. Yes. Yes. And, and, and sometimes it's, you know, uh, I've had several clients who they want their partner to be able to do it and they simply can't and kind of letting go of the notion like, Hey, you can use your vibrator on yourself, like Mm -hmm. during intercourse after before. So sometimes that helps, but if it's, it is really a mental block then that really goes back to me to two pieces and they're both in the mind, the sex feeling empowered, like this is, this is your equal right to pleasure. And then mindfulness, because a lot of times what I find with my clients, and I don't know if this is true for you, when we dig deep, it's like, well, I feel like I'm taking too long or right, maybe right. I look funny or do I smell funny? And yeah. Or they're, or they're trying to hold their stomach in with a partner, but maybe not alone. Right. Exactly. So <laughs> yeah. it's all that mindfulness, entitlement, body image, all those sex organ between your ears pieces then. Yeah. Yeah. So what kind of tips do you have for people with vulvas? to talk to their partners about what it is they need. You know, that communication is so crucial and yet so difficult for people. Oh, so difficult, so difficult. And I, you know, again, to me, that's, we really have a lack of training. So really helping people, really teaching them good communication skills, I statements, you know, I would like this, you know, meta communications, communicating about communication, big one, don't ask questions that aren't questions. Like, do you want to have sex? Well, it's not really a question because it can (laughs) either mean I really do, I hope you do, or I really don't, I hope you don't. Right, right. Really learning good communication skills. And then, you know, sitting down and I've had, and having a talk outside of the bedroom, I gave a workshop and a woman raised her hand and she said, I am so blown away by this. First of all, thank you. She said, I finally feel normal. Second of all, now I'm really stuck because I'd like a real orgasm, but I've been faking for 30 years. What do I do? Yeah. Oh, I've heard that too. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, well, I guess you could say you faked for 30 years and that could cause a lot of other problems, but you could. But another option is, you know, to say, hey, I really love you and I really really love having sex with you. And I listened to this great podcast, you know, or I read this great article or I read this book, you know, where it talked about how a lot of women really need intensive clitoral direct stimulation to orgasm. And, you know, I think it would be really fun for us to try to do more of that yeah. in, in our sex. I, I'd really like that, you know, is that okay with you? Do you, how do you feel about that? Are you willing? So to sort of frame it more positive into a, this is what I'd like for us to do. Um, I also have a chapter in the book called Clitoracy for Him. You don't have a, to have a clitoris to be yeah, clitoris. Yeah. And I've had some clients say, hey, 
you know, I read this book and I think there's some cool stuff for us to try. And there's a summary chapter for you. And so giving him something to read, or there's this great website called OMG Yes, Mm -hmm. you know, watching where women, you know, show the vulva external clitoral stimulation they need. And, you know, watching that together and talking about it, anything that opens that conversation. Yeah. And I'm thinking, okay, for, for male listeners of the show or readers of your book, like I, I'm imagining that some men, people with penises are really moved to become clitorate, right? To take this on, to take it seriously. They want their partner to have pleasure and any tips for them to be the one to bring this up? Like this, this isn't necessarily only going to come from those of us with vulvas. Oh, I like love there could be that some men question. driving this. I love that question. Yeah. You know, hey, I was listening to this great podcast and, you know, I, I, I learned that a lot of women fake orgasm because they need more clitoral stimulation than they're getting. And like, I don't know if that's true with, for you or not, but wow, like your pleasure is so important to me. It's, it's as important as my pleasure. I want to make sure that you're having as much pleasure as possible is there some stuff we could do for you that would make sex more enjoyable? Yeah, yeah. So we need we need men on this uh, Pleasure Crusader team too. Absolutely. Right? And I'm, Absolutely. I'm sure we'd get plenty. I mean, I just hear that from clients. Like the, these partners, male partners, are often, you know, really wanting their, their lover to have a great time. Exactly. And in fact, it takes the pressure off of them once men are clitorate. And Ian Kerner talks about this in his great, you know, how to oral sex manual, that once you know the way to women's pleasure that isn't through the penis, that it it really opens, it takes the pressure off of you to perform the impossible. And it really opens up really great avenues of mutuality and communication. And it benefits, clitoracy benefits everybody. Yeah, yeah, totally with you. So, So what would you say, what's the biggest takeaway you want people to get? From either, you know, our conversation today, but from your book specifically? I think the biggest takeaway is that sex is a intended to be pleasurable. Mm -hmm. It is intended to be equally pleasurable for both parties. And I don't mean that you both have to orgasm at the both of you, because sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Goal-oriented sex is also less likely to be orgasmic, but The fact is that if you really want an equally shared, pleasurable experience, then it's time to let go of porn images of orgasms through penetration for women and instead to equally value, equally value clitoral stimulation and penetration. They are both equally sex and need to be equally treated as sex. And let's communicate about that. Let's let's bring the clitoris into the limelight and into individual bedrooms. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I mean, I'll sign up for your team here. <laughs> okay. Pleasure Crusader team. Pleasure I love it. T-shirts or something, you know. We do. We yeah. do. I want those. <laughs> yeah. So would you uh, final little bit? Can you talk a little bit about, you know, about the book specifically? Anything else you want to promote? How people can learn more about you or get in touch? Sure. You can learn more about me at my website, which is www.drlauriemintz.com. And the book is available in Kindle, paperback, audiobook, anywhere books are sold, Amazon, indie bookstores, Barnes and Noble. And it really, it, it's a combination of why do, like the analysis, why do we have this problem? And then individual solutions to close the orgasm gap, to kind of change, change the sexual world one orgasm at a time. Perfect. I love it. I will put, I'll put all those links too in our show notes so that people can easily get to that. So Okay, great. And yeah, for those who do social media, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And I really just want, I really want people with everyone, people with penises, people with vulvas, men, women, I want everyone to know that, you know, equal opportunity orgasms can become a reality. Great. Well, thank you for this important work in the world. I mean, I mean that sincerely, really. So, Well, thank you for the important work you do and for 
helping me spread the word and for all the sex positive, accurate, empowering information you share on your on your podcast. And I'm really honored to be a guest. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, there are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advance access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web. And you get invited to that. I would love to have your membership in that become part of the Better Sex family. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.